But uh, essentially, uh, one of the one of the pieces was the uh, the post sampling harvest window changed from uh, the 15 days to, to 30 days. That was something that, through comment, uh, was was uh, certainly something they wanted changed. It was a compromise. It, it puts uh, puts the industry and the farming community in a better place. That's Fred Strathmeyer from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock, and today I'll talk to Fred about the 2021 hemp program here in Pennsylvania. And then we're going to talk to Cynthia Patron Hudock and Garrett Hall from a brand new company called CSQI that hopes to bring transparency and accountability to businesses along the hemp supply chain. But first, a quick message from our sponsor, IND Hemp, and then a couple of nuggets of hemp news. Are you using hemp seed oil in your CBD tinctures and topicals? Are you looking for a consistent, reliable, high-quality, American-grown and processed hemp seed oil? IND Hemp in Montana is cold-pressing grain daily and uses a three-stage filtration process to a one-micron polishing filter for their ultra-pure hemp seed oil. Ultra-pure hemp seed oil has consistent, superior clarity with no sediment. Five gallons or 5,000 liters, you can confidently source what you need at indhemp.com. Okay, just a few nuggets of hemp news this week. This first one comes from Hemp Grower Magazines, written by Doug Brown. The headline says, states begin implementing Delta-8 THC bans. Then the story says that Delta-8 THC offers the hemp industry commercial promise with the potential for fresh markets and new products. But as Delta-8 products increasingly land on store shelves and online shopping carts, they also invite scrutiny and in some cases action. The cannabinoid already has provoked bans in 12 states. Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, Colorado, Delaware, Kentucky, Idaho, Iowa, Mississippi, Montana, Rhode Island, and Utah, according to Marielle Weintraub, president of the U.S. Hemp Authority, which certifies hemp products and has recently decided not to certify Delta-8 products. Meanwhile, legislative bans are brewing in other states, including North Dakota, Alabama, and Oregon. Florida lawmakers moving in the opposite direction have established a legal framework for Delta-8. The emergence of commercial Delta-8 simultaneously thrills and worries hemp industry leaders. Prior to Delta-8, no hemp products got people high. All right, here's another one. This one is from sourcingjournal.com. It's written by Arthur Friedman. The headline says, Wrangler Parent Expands Hemp Collab with Panda Biotech. Who writes these headlines? Anyway, so the story says, Contour Brands Incorporated, with a brand portfolio led by Lee and Wrangler, announced an expansion of its collaboration with Dallas-based Panda Biotech, an emerging leader in the industrial hemp fiber industry. Contour Brands and Panda Biotech will work to bring traceability and scale to the textile-grade cottonized hemp grown and processed in the United States. Yeah, this is great news. I like it. I've reached out to Panda Biotech a couple of times over email, but they have not responded to me. So if you're listening down there in Texas, come on, give me a shout. All right, let's get into these interviews. Let's talk to Fred. Fred Strathmeyer, welcome back to our podcast. How are you doing? Very good, Eric. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, could you give us a brief introduction as to who you are and what your role is at the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture? Sure, Eric. Um, I'm a deputy secretary at the Department of Ag. Um, I oversee uh, bureaus, work with bureaus such as dog law enforcement, uh, horse racing, uh, hardwoods uh, development council, uh, and uh, weights and measures, amusement rides, and the reason we're on the call today, plant industry. Okay. Uh, let's just talk about amusement park rides. No, I'm kidding. Let's talk about hemp. So how are things looking from your point of view, hemp-wise, this year? 
Um, very good. Uh, we're, uh, you know, once we got uh, through this, the uh, pandemic and th all through the, uh, the pains and the challenges that it created, uh, this year has gone very smoothly. Uh, we we uh, stopped taking uh, applications uh, in uh, early April. Uh, we ended up with uh, 417 uh, growing permits and 60 processing permits. Uh, it's slightly down about uh, from the 510 and the 71. Mm -hmm. But last year, Eric, only uh, about 335 of those uh, process, or the growing permits actually use uh, their permit. So hmm. if you look at it from that standpoint, uh, I think we're, we're right in line. Do you think that decrease in, in applicants is because of the, you know, the, the boom and then the bust of the CBD market? I would suspect it is. Uh, a little bit of it uh, is the, um, I think that people are figuring out uh, their own game plans uh, at their farming, in their farming businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, they're beginning to understand a little bit more of, of the marketplace. And so consequently, I think there's more strategic uh, actions being taken by these, by these businesses. Oh, good. All right. So are there major changes to the Pennsylvania program this year? Well, uh, the major changes uh, followed the uh, the interim, the, what was the interim final rule is now the final rule. Uh, we we have our uh, latest plan. Uh, they had asked for a few questions to be answered. So we uh, submitted that plan uh, about uh, a week ago or so, uh, waiting to, uh, to get uh, confirmation that uh, we have everything covered. But uh, essentially, uh, one of the one of the pieces was the uh, the post sampling harvest window changed from uh, the 15 days to, to 30 days. That was something that, through comment, uh, was was uh, certainly something they wanted changed. It was a compromise, but it was still mm -hmm. it puts uh, puts the industry and the farming community in a better place. Good. And how does that affect things on your end? I know last year you had what, like independently contracted sampling agents going out and taking samples. Is that same program in effect this year? It is, Eric. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we um, had about 45 participants uh, across the state last year. It went very well. Uh, we just, uh, as of uh, today, uh, put uh, the notice in the Pennsylvania Bulletin. Mm -hmm. So once uh, we get through that process, uh, then uh, we'll start taking applications uh, for uh, these uh, certified uh, hemp sampling uh, program uh, agents. Uh, again, uh, just like last year, there's training needed. Uh, there's a certain uh, score that's required. Um, those sort of things stayed, stayed in place. Uh, and again, we, we learned from last year, so we uh, added uh, different uh, pieces of training to, to the uh, entire program. So uh, again, following things that have been required through the hemp final rule. Okay. Is the department doing anything in particular to strengthen the fiber and grain side of the hemp industry in the state? Well, uh, one, one of the, uh, the, the good things for us is that uh, in the Department of Markets, uh, gentleman by uh, the name of Phil Stober has gotten involved very much so. Um, he is uh, in, in charge of the economic development uh, that comes with uh, the uh, marketing uh, group that we have at PDA. And he's been working uh, a lot over the last several months with uh, particular groups, uh, individuals, um, and, and the like. Uh, we've got a meeting coming up uh, in the near future, uh, actually, with the uh, Lebanon County uh, Economic Development Group. Hmm. So uh, looking forward to that call as well. All right. What kinds of projects are you working on? Well, primarily right now, uh, they're, they're, we're trying to work on uh, the, you know, the textiles, the bioplastics, um, clothing, uh, boiling down to, uh, like you just asked, about the fiber ends of things. Uh, we see this as uh, something that we can expand on, uh, certainly less controversial and something that we feel that the state can move on today as opposed to, you know, having to wait for uh, any kind of federal action uh, around CBD, for instance. Right. Are there some notable projects that you can talk about? Well, there is a project that, uh, that we've uh, partially funded uh, out in uh, Western PA with uh, Don Enterprises. Uh, where they're going to be retrofitting a, a house uh, with uh, hemp products from hempcrete to hemp insulation 
uh, flooring uh, and the like. Right. Uh, so we're, we're real happy about that. Uh, there's a couple of other projects a little closer to home over in Berks County, uh, similar uh, types of uh, use of fiber for uh, construction. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, very happy that, that these uh, projects are finally finding their way uh, to the mainstream. Yeah, right. So you're talking about Drew and Anna over at Coexist Build in Berks County? I am. Yeah, that was out there a few weeks ago. They're doing some great stuff. Uh, we're Yeah, we're real happy, like I said, that uh, you know we're several years, as you know, into to our, our hemp program, and uh, it seems to be evolving very well. Okay. Um, how about like on the grain side? I know, you know, there's Josh Lidecker up in, uh, where's that, Lycoming County. He's, he's a grain yep. grower. Um, yep. Is there, are there other growers out there or other businesses that are, are trying to get in on that? Um, was it Kreider Farms in Lancaster County is talking about some kind of like hemp fed egg? I'm not sure if that's out on the market or not yet. Uh, it's not. Um so all those anything where uh you're feeding something to an animal has to go through a process as i think you're aware uh the approval has to come through uh fda and uh and through uh, avco ultimately to to be uh allowed to be fed to to the animal population and each one of those has to be uh, individually if you will uh, different segments have to be tested uh, individually because what might be good for one may not be good for another. Right. So uh, it, it, again, it still needs to go through the process. Uh, but yes, there is, is a lot more uh, interest. And, and again, we're here to support as much as we can. Right. Yeah. Once that opens up, it's going to be a great opportunity for hemp growers and for, you know, livestock farmers. Correct. Yeah. I mean, you can feed hemp to your kids, but not to your chickens, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this past year, there was a lot of talk and whatever of Delta eight THC in the hemp industry. And it seems that like a lot of CBD growers are taking advantage of this murky legal status of Delta eight as sort of a way of selling what is essentially pot. Like, do you think this hurts the overall hemp brand or the program or what are your thoughts on that? Well, again, I think that uh, what they found is a little bit of a loophole. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, it has been discussed, um, you know, both at the state level and the federal level. Um, technically, it's it still is illegal. Um, you're getting you're going to hear different uh, points of view, but uh, boils down to uh, from what we understand at the federal level, it's still part. This falls into the category of uh, controlled substance, right? right. Uh, and therefore, it would be illegal. Mm-hmm. So, right? Yeah, I went to the cannabis festival in Kutztown last week, and I was just surprised by how sort of, you know, I don't know, open all of this Delta Eight stuff was. It was a shock to me, and I didn't didn't think it's really. I don't know. I don't. I personally don't think it's good for the hemp brand. I think that's it's sort of dangerous territory. Right. And uh, there have been instances around the country and, and it's been spoken to that uh, people have have had really bad results from uh, ingesting this type of material. So, mm. yeah, we're caution to the wind on that one. Right. And I guess slightly related is, you know, there's all this talk in the state, you know, between the lieutenant governor and then the um, the senators, uh, Laughlin and Street, about a, a recreational program. And they they all say that it's going to be good for farmers uh, I understand how it's going to be good for the economy, but necessarily good for farmers. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? So I think that, uh, Eric, you're, you and I are both aware that, you know, some people got into this hemp uh, uh, program uh, with some something else in mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, uh, as, as a whole, I, I don't know that it's uh, good for our farming community. Uh, there's going to be a lot more involved than I think that uh, people realize. Uh, it's not, uh, I suspect, uh, from what we've seen in other states, it's not going to be the Wild West. Uh, so I'm just not sure that, that, uh, that uh, you know, from the farming community standpoint, that it's going, you're going to see the, the boom from, from this particular uh, mm-hmm. recreational conversation. Right. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm very comfortable in saying is that it, it and as you, you brought up already, is the you know this tendency now to turn more towards the the feed and the fiber side of and the industrial side of of hemp 
uh, because again, we, we look at this as uh, non-challenging and uh, this kind of the sky's the limit. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's working with and getting manufacturing and processing in those channels uh, opened up here in the state. Right, right. Yeah. Um, how about the Pennsylvania Hemp Steering Committee? Um, I know you've been working with them. Um, how, like, what sorts of things have you learned from that committee that, like, you wouldn't have known about otherwise? Well, first and foremost, I agree that uh, the, the, the steering committee uh, from the leadership from Dr. Kander has been uh, absolutely outstanding. Um, they bring up uh, different topics that uh, they run into, uh, whether statewide or nationwide. And so just having that, uh, that kind of uh, resource, uh, the wealth of knowledge that, that all these individuals are bringing through their businesses, but now sharing uh, in, in, this, uh, in this particular forum as a steering committee uh, has, has nothing more than things to be gained for, for the state. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've looked at, uh, you know, different things from the bioplastic sides to, you know, um, just the, this whole conversation around uh, the feed. Right. Uh, it's, it's just been a very engaging group and uh, real, real happy that, uh, that they're doing as well as they're doing and uh, real, uh, really happy that we are, have the relationship that we have with the steering committee. Good. Okay. Um, what else should hemp farmers or potential hemp farmers be thinking about right now from your point of view? Well, I think that again, uh, you know, it's always uh, moderation. We have quite a few pieces of this puzzle that uh, we, uh, we just haven't connected just yet. And so, you know, my caution to the wind though is, is to, you know, walk before you run. Uh, I think that uh, early on, uh, a lot of people uh, thought that uh, they were going to get rich quick. Uh, unfortunately, they, they have uh, had a bad taste. And uh, I think we personally, I'd like to see those people get back into it uh, and, and get involved in a way that it can be very profitable and, and very successful for them. Right. Um, so we know about, you know, like the lack of processing um, capacity in the state or even pretty much the country as far as, you know, fiber goes, what other kind of issues in the supply chain do you see? Well, I think that, uh, you know, if we're going to get, uh, past, uh, or into the conversation of CBD, for instance, uh, one of the pieces that I know that I'm working on, uh, along with the uh, department of health is uh, some type of a, a labeling and uh, the safety mm. uh, piece of this uh, conversation. Um, we know that, uh, you know, right now you can basically buy it almost anywhere. Uh, we know that there's not a lot of restraints on it. And so uh, from where we sit, uh, if there's next steps, it's, uh, as I see it, it's uh, creating a, a better environment for the public that is purchasing the product. So we've got to look at the safety side of things and uh, do a better job with uh, that, for instance. Okay. Um, what else would you like to share with our listening audience? Well, ag- again, uh, just uh, one of the things I would be uh, want you to do is to keep looking at, uh, you know, the grant programs that are out there, the ag research uh, monies that uh, the governor's made available through the PA Farm Bill. Um, that. Um, uh, we're looking forward to, to working with uh, this farming community to expand, uh, to create the diversity that, that we're looking for amongst uh, the new, new farm uh, operations that come into play. Uh, looking at the, the potentials for the urban farming piece of this. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit out there uh, that we've really untapped, uh, quite fr- frankly, right now, Eric, that... Uh, we need to continue working hard on uh, as we go forward with this program. Okay. Fred Strathmeyer from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for your time. (laughs) You're welcome. All right, before we get into our interview with Cynthia and Garrett from CSQI, I thought we'd have a couple of words from... Kentucky Senator and Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Industrial hemp. 
Cynthia Patrone Hudock and Garrett Hall. Welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Eric. Doing well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, Cynthia. You've been on the show before. The first time was back in 2019. You and your farming partner, Jamie Hicks, uh, joined me here to talk about Hemp Alternative. And then last September, on my little mini road trip, I visited your farm in Southern Chester County. But also, you've been appointed to the Pennsylvania Hemp Steering Committee, and you've just sort of been in the thick of it now for a few years. So through all of that work, you have sort of identified some issues with the supply chain, more like a credibility issue uh, within the supply chain. And you've come up with an interesting business idea to help solve that problem. And that's CSQI, Cannabis Services Quality Index. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But I wondered if you could sort of talk about your journey from hemp grower to steering committee member to now launching this new venture. Absolutely. Um, so in 2019, you're right, that was our um, initial year for grow. And I think many farmers, uh, as I did, has struggled with seed selection through field management, harvest and processing. And whether it was the cannabinoid grow or the fiber, we did both. We struggled to find and vet and even keep good partners in our supply chain throughout the year. And I I think 2020 didn't get much better, maybe even worse with the onset of COVID. Um, And I do sit on the steering committee for the Pennsylvania Ag Department and its um, research opportunities and needs is the subcommittee. And we're very focused on the needs piece, right? So that's where um, as growers, you know, we're really vertically integrated through supply chain partnerships. And now in the market, as you mentioned with cannabinoid consumer products, we've developed those through collaboration with an osteopathic physician, Dr. Lake and a compounding pharmacist. And then we're performing fiber studies with Stroud Water Research Center and Jefferson University Design Engineer and Commerce College around Bast and Herd for development of sustainable products. Um, And then this year we'll add to our grow some grain and look for high protein products to hopefully tackle and feed the underserved. But all of this requires a tremendous amount of supply chain partners. And I, I believe in building teams with partners as they are they can be their own subject matter expertise. Uh, um, I don't necessarily feel like we need to be experts at everything. So it's been quite interesting because I think um, with the struggles, it led me to reach out to Garrett, who you'll speak with today. And he's a colleague of mine from healthcare IT. I've been in that for about uh, the last 15 years, helping physicians come up on electronic medical records. And I saw this business model of transparency really work in the healthcare IT space. And I thought it should... um, it should be brought here into the cannabis industry. And, you know, many folks say, if you want to come into the cannabis industry, do what it is you do best and just bring it to our industry, right? Because we need a lot of um, professionalism and, and development over time. So with the challenge I faced, um, Garrett, I said, you know, shed some light on our service offerings. Let's figure out who's playing how they're doing, what are the gaps, not only in the service offerings that exist today, but gaps in, in the supply chain itself. And so we launched the Cannabis Services Quality Index. It is cannabis focused, not just hemp, but we're starting with hemp. And of course, it's a global, it's a global issue and it's a global application, but we're starting here at home in the US. Um, the primary focus is really to capture the voice of the customer in the B2B supply chain and it provides insight on vendor offerings and performance. So uh, look, we're looking at f- efficient, cost-effective avenues to engage with vendor partners. And, and our research of vendors s- sort of starts with the base, right? What are their offerings, their capabilities? What are the financial value of their services? Are they meeting or exceeding expectations as they advertise around quality and timeliness? So, so kind of the service level perspective. And then you know certain, certain thresholds that just naturally result in a ranking of outcomes. So, so it's about bringing traditional transparency and insight to what I consider this disruptive emerging industry of hemp. So uh, that's about it in a nutshell. All right. So what does that look like? How does it work? How will farmers and processors, you know, interact with this new business? 
Yeah, so let me hand it over to Garrett to talk a little bit about the business model and the service offering and even how some of the listeners can get engaged. <clears throat> Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, it's It's been an absolute pleasure uh, working with Cynthia and, and jumping into this industry. I'm still new to the industry. I'm still learning the, the ins and outs, uh, meeting uh, really great people. Um, but what I do bring is this experience of doing customer research uh, in the past in the healthcare IT space. The idea is you really get to know a company through their customers. Um, you can sit through countless sales pitches and hear what they say about themselves, but really what, what it comes down to is uh, what is the experience that their customers have had with them? What do they say about them in, in a number of different areas? Like Cynthia mentioned with you know, subject matter expertise, timeliness, you know, the value. Um, it, it's really gathering as many customer references as possible, aggregating it into sort of one voice. Um, and the interesting thing that happens as you do this research and as you talk to a wide customer base is that a couple really consistent stories usually emerge. Um, and you know, so they can be good stories, they can be negative stories about the experience that the customers have had, but, but it, it becomes very apparent um, you know, if there are any gaps with a co uh, company, you can learn that. And then, so our whole goal is to talk to as many customers of, of these supply chain vendors as possible to gather this feedback. It's all anonymous. So, you know, we don't put a name on it, but we just aggregate it all. And then we're producing reports um, and, and a directory so that, um, you know, going back to, to Cynthia's issue as a grower, when when she's looking to find a partner to help her process or test um, the idea is she can come to us and look at the data that we've collected and it's like it's like talking to you know 40 or 50 different peers but she doesn't have time to do that and so we're essentially doing all that legwork for her um, to help her make a more informed decision. And, and Eric, I have to say, um, just with processors alone for 2019's biomass, I, you know, I've always said I had to kiss like 14 frogs before I found the, the 15th that was the prince. So, um, you know, that's where I think this this solution of CSQI may not solve the actual um, challenge. But it, but it will certainly uh, allow the consumers to solve, right? Because we're going to bring this transparency and then the competitive, the natural competitive nature of the marketplace will solve the challenge of, of, the, uh, of the service model. Okay. So it's like consumer reports, but for businesses along the hemp supply chain. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. And it can okay. be a B to B or it can be a B to C, right? Um, so, so, and then remember, a lot of product companies we're not evaluating products, but pro a lot of product companies have services they offer. So, we will be evaluating services. Okay, so let's say I'm a I'm a hemp farmer and I'm trying to find somebody to process my four acres of CBG, and I want to get a distillate made or something. So, I would look at your directory and I would see all of the different processors in my area, and then I would see what their customers have said about them and what it was like dealing with them and working with them. And I would then be able to make a more informed decision as to who I should get to process my, my flower. Right, right. The idea is, um, is you'll be able to see not only the capabilities that we've validated, right? So uh, we'll talk to other customers, that say, yes, we have used them for X, Y, and Z. And so if we validate enough of those capabilities, then we will list that as, as an, a, a true offering okay. uh, that they can provide. And then on top of that, we'll also have the customer satisfaction ratings, right? So sometimes somebody can, a company can offer a great service, um, in, you know, in terms of their capabilities, but if you have to sit around and, and wait for them to get back to you or, mm. you know, if they, you know, if, if the value isn't there or, you know, something goes wrong along the way, it, it, you know, it's important to know that um, going into it. All right. And I think, Eric, there's a couple of things that really intrigued me about this business model and how it could help us here in the cannabis or, or hemp industry. And 
One is finding the right partner. So for instance, when I developed the consumer products and launched them, I wanted a manufacturer who would just help me on a really small scale pilot, right? I, I just wanted to get like 200 um, bottles of cream out and let's just pilot the 200, get the customer feedback and then continue to develop what we would ultimately launch. And so, you know, at, at this point, that's the right service vendor for me. And then eventually I'll want to scale and, and he won't fit the bill. Right. And I'll need to come back and sort of figure out, okay, who, who am I going to partner to scale with? And I think the other interesting part, which maybe Garrett, you could speak to is there are service hiccups, right? So let's take the testing labs. I mean, probably everybody knows at this point that I had a significant amount of testing labs um, challenges, especially in 2020, but, but there's an interesting uh, avenue to those challenges that, uh, I think CSQI can can uh, build into the reports. And so, Garrett, you want to talk a little bit about how these service hiccups get handled in CSQI and it's not like you're dropping to the bottom of the list. Right. So the idea is we want to we want to help the, the grower, uh, but we also a byproduct of this is that we want to really raise the bar for the whole industry. Um, so we, when we get feedback and we, we get a, reach a certain threshold, um, to really provide a, a consistent, a, a strong story about a company, we also want to work with that company to say, Hey, you, you may be aware of this. You may not be aware, but here's what 15 of your customers have said about you. And, you know, we've identified the following gaps. We'd like to work with you to overcome those gaps so that future customers don't have those problems. Okay. And so we want to help, you know, we want to help the whole industry kind of reach a new standard. And we do that by, by consulting and, and really just kind of almost holding a mirror up to, to some of these companies to say, here's how you're perceived good and bad. And, and it, you know, if there are gaps, we want to help you, um, improve the, that service or, uh, or say, look, you, you only do the following, uh, you know, you only provide the following services, but we've heard from our customers that they want something in addition to what you're providing. So if you want to stay strong in the market, you may, you may want to consider expanding your offerings. Otherwise you may be left behind. And, and I think uh, one quick follow-up. So I'll give you an example with the lab specifically, you know, I had three separate lab partners, two of them had, well, all three of them had problems, but um, when they did have problems, only one of the three really rose to the occasion and um, came out to my farm, redid the test, you know, it was above and beyond the call of duty to resolve my conflict. and. Okay. So it's not as if sort of, oh, they had a hiccup. So they fell to the bottom of the list in terms of my my uh, rating. In, in my mind, the one out of the three that actually came in and gave me the level of service that I expected to to fix their mistake right. uh, actually gets a it's a great score. Right. So yeah. think of it that that way is there will be a lot of service hiccups because these organizations are new to the hemp industry or to cannabis in general. And so um, it's just a matter of them being able to show based on the customer's uh, response, how um, whether I would recommend them or not. And I, and I would. Right. OK. Right. So I don't know if it's because this industry is so new or because some of it comes out of like a shady black market marijuana space. But there's this like flakiness sometimes in like I hear stories from people a lot, you know, dealing with different vendors or whatever. But so what you're intending to do is bring like an accountability to the industry that's not currently there. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, how do you intend to get all of the information from the farmers? Yeah, great question. So that can happen a number of different ways. Uh, so number one, we we have a network of growers that, that we currently work with that you know have already provided feedback for us. Um, and just to go back really quickly to answer a, a previous question about you know the website or you know where, where people access inf this information. Um, at the moment, we're just collecting all of the data. Um, at the end of the year, we're going to unveil these, these ratings. Um, we're going to publish a report. We're going to 
um, you know, kind of turn the turn the key on the website and and let everybody know what data we've uh, you know we've mm -hmm. gathered that you know throughout this year. But right now, we're we're heavily in the data collection uh, phase, and so we do that by reaching out to the the growers that we know that we have a, a, a you know a network with. Uh, we are partnering with different associations who have members that will benefit from this. Um, they're asking their members to uh, complete our survey and provide feedback on the vendors that they've used. And then we also engage directly with vendors who will provide a client list to us. And then we'll reach out to those clients specifically and say, hey, we know that you've used you know, X lab. Uh, we'd like to get anonymous candid feedback on on how they've per, uh, performed for you okay um how do you monetize this um mostly through working with the vendors um so any grower who participates in our in our uh, survey and in providing feedback they get access to this for free um but in working with the vendors um we we you know we charge them for consulting but we also um, charge them for access to the data so that they can, again, just see what their customers are saying. And then, you know, we develop a plan with them to kind of work with them on, on improving their services. Okay. Um, what are the safeguards against this becoming like a pay to play situation? Yeah. Great question also. Um, so essentially we just let the data speak, um, whatever data comes in, we don't editorialize it. We're just collecting it, uh, analyzing it, and then putting it in a format that's easy to digest. Um, we have safeguards if 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 people try to stack the deck. You know, we face this in healthcare where a company would would provide a cherry picked client list. You know, they'd say, "Oh well, we'll, we'll include these hospitals, but we know this one went poorly, so we're not going to include them." Um, but the thing is, we usually would just find that hospital anyway through that kind of that organic network mm -hmm. reach out. They they may think that they could could get away with uh, leaving people off the list, but just through that that broad outreach, mm -hmm. uh, we we would typically find those customers and and be able to report okay. on them. And Garrett, speak a little bit to um, you know if something doesn't look right, you know that yeah, speak yes, a little bit to that. Yeah, so we have a process as well. Um, we we monitor all the data that's coming in and, you know, we just have safeguards in place that if something doesn't fit kind of the normal process of data influx, then it gets immediately flagged. So that could be if we get a big influx of really positive data or a big influx of really negative data, uh, you know, it just it doesn't it doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right. So we flag that. And then we go to a deeper uh, validation process to really scrutinize that data to make sure that, that it's, you know, it's all reliable, you know, so there's nobody out there stacking the deck. And then, and then we have a process for them reaching out to those folks to say, you know, did you, did you complete the survey? You know, and, and when we go a little deeper that what we are representing as customer data is in fact, legitimate, accurate customer data. So I can sort of see this sort of snowballing a little bit. Like once you get some farmers and processors in there, then just through word of mouth, more people are going to want to be in there. Like they don't want to miss out on it. Because um, I think everybody has an interest to bring, you know, accountability to this brand new industry. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, it's, it's uh, we're starting there with farmers. But remember, everyone along the supply chain has a, uh, has a vendor that's supporting them with products and services, right? So if the farmer simply is selling his bio, his or her biomass to a processor, but the processor uses three vendors, service vendors to help them, um, you know, through their distillate or whether it's, uh, you know, maybe it's the fiber side, right? So we know we can decorticate, but then where does it go from there? And there's other suppliers of, of services, right? So yeah. at any point, sort of, you could be a user of a service at the same time that you're offering a service. And so we're, we're starting small, but we'll eventually be working down that entire supply chain. Okay. That's a huge undertaking, right? It is. Yeah. And you're going to, it's not just hemp then. So it's not just cannabinoid hemp. It's going to be all hemp and then all cannabis all the way up to 
dispensaries and, and whatever, right? Oh, and, and it's interesting because we have a call tomorrow afternoon with a gentleman who um, is from the EU, right? Because in the fiber arena, a lot of those processing capabilities are international and not just here in the US. So, um, you know, it, it'll be global. So it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at it in its most simplest uh, tactical path, uh, as part of the Pennsylvania Hemp Steering Committee, I'm going to be focusing on the state of Pennsylvania, right? And let's develop what those supply chain services look like right here at home within the hemp industry. And hopefully we'll have maybe a report to publish by the end of June for just, okay. just PA hemp. But you're right, when you stand back and you look strategically, this is, uh, it, it's, it's a uh, mind boggling and it's going to be years and years to develop this. And then of course, maintain it. Right. Um, so how can farmers and, you know, people in the space get involved? Like what, um, how, how can they get your, their data to you for this? We have a, an online survey that, uh, that has every, all the questions that, that we need uh, them to answer. So, uh, I think Eric, you're going to provide a, a link to that survey. Yep. I'll put the links to the survey on the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. Yeah. Yeah. So growers can, can access that. Um, uh, they can also just call me directly. We can set up an appointment to, to do an interview if they prefer to do it over the okay. phone. Um, and you know, like, like I mentioned right now, we are heavily in that phase of, of gathering data. So we'd like to speak to as many growers as possible and and get as you know as, as much feedback on on a wide range of, of vendors as possible and then we can really start providing that you know that the in those insights to to the growers yeah this could be a game changer for the industry you know bringing a level of transparency and accountability to it uh, yeah hey one other aspect that that i think is important is um we see a lot of investors coming into the industry as well looking to, to invest money. I've read a number of articles about investors who have come in and then they, they get bitten by something that, you know, they didn't know whether it's, you know, companies aren't keeping accurate books or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, we want those investors in the industry, but, but we, we want to help them kind of separate the, the companies that are doing things the right way versus the companies that aren't doing that. Um, and so we want to provide data to those investors as well. And, and the problem is with a new industry, emerging industry like this, when you have companies that aren't doing things the right way, it really reflects poorly on the rest of the industry. You know, so those companies that are doing things the right way, they're getting harmed because there's like this, you know, this stigma about the industry. And so we want to dispel that and, and, and say, yes, there are those that, that are you know, maybe not doing things the way they should. We want to call that out. But at the same time, we also want to highlight the companies that are really doing a great job because we want those investors to come in and feel comfortable that they they understand the industry and they understand that there are some really, really great companies that are worthy of investment. And, you know, I think the other piece to point out is, you know, it's a it's a heavy lift to even, even gather the data on the processing or the service suppliers, right? In mm -hmm. general, all service suppliers. So whether it's labs or um, even the, the manufacturing organization. So we are gathering material, we're taking a look at websites, we're speaking to these, um, service suppliers in the in the chain and we're we're kind of developing out that directory so that's another initiative underway so one is sort of okay let's gather the voice and who these farmers and processors and and folks are using for their supply chain services and then it's actually speaking with the companies and understanding sort of the total picture of their offering and uh so it's it's a parallel track basically right. okay yeah, and, and we would love for those service providers to reach out to us as well so that we can start a dialogue and, and start working with them. Okay. Why don't you give us the phone number so folks listening can jot it down? Yeah. Yeah. My phone number is 435-668-7496. Okay. 435-668-7496. We'll get you right to Garrett Hall at CSQI. Um, how about an email address? Sure. Uh, it's Garrett Hall, G-A-R-R-E-T-T, 
H A L L at C S Q index.com. Okay. I will list that along with the phone number and the links to the online surveys at the show page for this episode at lancasterfarming.com. I think this could be really good for everybody in the industry. And it looks like you're off to a great start. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah, I wish you great success in uh, in this endeavor. Is there anything else you want to add before we go? No, I think it's been terrific. Uh, happy to come on anytime and talk about all the wonderful things we're doing as we push forward and stay very bullish on hemp. Yeah, bullish on hemp. I like that. All right. Well, Cynthia and Garrett from Cannabis Services Quality Index, CSQI, thank you both for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Eric. Oh, there's the music. I guess that means the show's over. Thank you very much for listening to today's show. Be sure to go to LancasterFarming.com and click on those links to fill out the survey for CSQI and check out those news nuggets and also uh, go visit our sponsor, IND Hemp. My name is Eric Harlock. I am the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. You can always get in touch with me by email. Send it to podcast at lancasterfarming.com or you can call me up and leave me a message at 717-721-4462. Thanks again for listening to today's show. If you want to hear more about our road trip that's coming up, just drop me a line. I'll tell you all about it. And be sure to tune in next week because, fingers crossed, I'm going to be talking to Janet Burns. She's a writer. She writes about hemp and all kinds of cool stuff. It's going to be a fascinating conversation. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. Until next time, I'll see you in the newspaper. Episode 130 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2021 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, which is part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written and recorded, edited and produced by yours truly, Eric Herlock. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow.